Today, I want to tell you about our all new spiced lentil chili. It's available on our website at plantstrongfoods.com and it's coming to Whole Foods stores across the country in the very beginning of June. This gorgeous, globally inspired dish features four kinds of beans in warm East African spices like coriander, cumin, cardamom. We combined aromatic ginger, garlic, and onion with a hint of sweetness from whole blended dates to give this new concept considerable depth of flavor without the need for any processed oils or excessive sodium. It's delicious on its own or over a bed of quinoa or your grain of choice. It's ready to eat in just 90 seconds, and it's a great way to spice up your workday lunch routine when you're looking for something new and different. Some fun facts. This Ethiopian chili features 17 different herbs, spices, and aromatics that are all slow simmered with a variety of beans and vegetables. There's three different varieties of lentils, brown, red, and my favorite, a black beluga, and together with the chickpeas, help bring this chili to 9 grams of fiber and 10 grams of protein per serving. And if you're like me and you eat the whole box, that's 18 grams of fiber and 20 grams of protein per container. You can order a sampler pack of this chili and our four other new flavors by visiting plantstrongfoods.com. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. The mission at Plant Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant-based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant-based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, everyone. It is Memorial Day weekend here in the good old U.S. of A., and I would love to extend my appreciation and send a big, warm, heartfelt thank you to all who have served in the armed forces In honor of this holiday, I am proud to welcome a special guest, Sergeant Bill Muir, or otherwise known as Sergeant Vegan. Sergeant Vegan has always had a think-outside-the-box attitude from being a straight-edge punk rocker back in the day to going vegan in 1992 and then joining the military just after 9-11, where he served as a U.S. Army paratrooper. And all of this you guessed it, as a hardcore vegan. Needless to say, it wasn't easy, but he was and is so convicted and grounded in his values that he made it work. Today, Bill is a registered nurse where he continues to stand up for those who need assistance, whether it's helping humankind, animals, or our planet. Sergeant Vegan is ready to serve. Please welcome Bill Muir, Sergeant Vegan. Well, here we are, Plant Strong Podcast. We got um, Bill Muir uh, as my special guest today. Bill, I'm actually surprised that you and I have never crossed paths over the last decade or so. Yeah, I mean, uh, you've been doing the vegan thing a while too. I'm I'm going on 30 years. I it's a small community, but everybody's well spread out and uh Yeah, you know. Yeah. It's just yeah. One of those things. Yeah. So, not only are you um are you vegan, you are vegan strong and all you day are, long. <laughs> all day long, aka the nickname Sergeant Vegan, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And I love the fact, and we're going to dive into this, that you decided to confront being a vegan in probably the most hostile environment known to mankind, womankind, and that is, right, the uh, the army. Um, yeah. And wow. I mean, 
big kudos to you for sticking to your guns and to your beliefs and your commitment and everything that was really important to you. So let's, let's kind of unpack that, that journey, but let me, let's start kind of, if you don't mind at the beginning. So tell me a little bit about the family that you grew up in and how you guys ate uh, in, in your family. Well, thank you very much for that question. Very normal suburban, uh, upbringing. Uh, one, I'm one of four kids. I'm, I was the oldest kid. I grew up in a Catholic uh, household right outside of Philadelphia in a very small, I would almost say insignificant town called Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. The fun fact about that place is a lot of the area that I grew up in was used for the movie Silver Lining Playbook. So if you ever watch that, most of the landmarks that, that occur in that other than the final scene are in my hometown. Why they decided to use Lanzan, I don't know, but it, it makes me nostalgic to think about. I grew up, as you would guess, eating meat like most people who are raised in America. I didn't think anything of it. I just thought, okay, this is what we do. I grew up, my dad was a hunter. Uh, I grew up hunting as a kid. I didn't think anything of it because that's what most people that I knew were into. And I thought, oh, that's fine. I guess we go into the woods and try to shoot something with a gun. That's cool. Uh... And it kind of went like that until pretty much my first semester of college where somebody threw off some offhanded remark about eating veal. And I thought, that's weird. Like, hold on a second. Like, you're just concerned about what's happening to baby cows in this situation, but not any other situation. I thought, and, but they still ate meat in every other capacity. And, and I just kind of pushed it off. But because that seed was in my mind, when my mom asked me, hey, well, what I was going to give up for Lent, which for viewers and listeners, if you haven't heard of Lent, Lent is, it's a 40-day period before Easter where I think a lot of different Christians, but mostly Catholics, they decide to give up something in the idea that it's going to bring them closer to God or make them a better person. And to be snarky, when my mom asked me that as a punk rocker, at 18 years old, I was like, hmm, what would really like get to my folks? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to tell them I'm not going to eat meat. There was no word for vegan that I had heard at that moment. I know the word vegan came in the, uh, into existence, I believe, in the 40s or 50s. It had never passed through my lips. I hadn't even heard the word before, but vegetarian I knew. And I said, I'm going to go vegetarian. And that, of course, freaked my mom out and Friends and family alike thought that they would be visiting me in the hospital very shortly, that if you didn't get that emergency injection of meat uh, every single day in your diet, you were going to die. Uh, obviously, like we know now, that's ridiculous, but that's what people thought. And you weren't, and you, even though you didn't have the education around the nutrition, you were pretty confident that you could abstain from meat for a month and you wouldn't be hospitalized for protein deficiency. Well, that's the that was the the fun thing about it. I had no idea. A uh, family doctor, I, I I think I had a checkup around that time, and they were amazed that I wasn't already dead. Uh, like the general thought was, if you don't eat animal products on a daily basis, three times a day basis, you're going to immediately get sick and go into that mythical protein deficiency ward that everyone thinks the vegans are going to that, uh, you know, that doesn't have any idea what they're, they're talking about with health and nutrition. And because that was the environment that I was socialized in, I guess I thought that that was going to happen to me too. Fast forward, even just through that period, I felt fine. I was like, hold on a second. You guys had told me that this I was going to get sick and I was just doing it just because, well, I mean, as a punk rock kid, I wanted to question everything. And here I am. I was college wrestlers. I felt great. I was a runner. None of that. None. And to be clear, I wasn't vegan at that in the first couple of months. I was just vegetarian, but it was fine. As we know now, it comes really down to getting your macros and calories. That you don't need meat or dairy products at all. But at, in that early experimental phase, I was just doing it to do it, not really tracking calories, not really tracking macros, just eating to make sure that I had enough in my stomach and I was fine. Yeah. Um, so you're a freshman at the University of Pittsburgh. Well, at that point, I, I went to the university or uh, uh, LaSalle University in Philadelphia. Okay. Okay. Um, and is this where, or is it University of Pittsburgh where you decided 
that you were going to major in a dual degree in Japanese and sociology. Oh, you did your research. I like that. <laughs> uh, I think early on, I think by my the end of my freshman year of college, I decided that I wanted to make to concentrate on Japanese, and that's what. And my later in my junior year in college in University of Pittsburgh, I transferred to University of Pittsburgh because they had a better Asian studies department, better Japanese department, and that they ended up sending me through an exchange program to Kansai Gaida University in Osaka in Hirakatashi. I'm sure nobody knows where that is uh, that's listening to this, but just in case you are, um, hey, it's, it's a great town. Yeah. Well, how's your Japanese? Have you hung on to any of your Japanese, like Domo Arigato? Uh, Mr. Roboto. Manoskoshi nihongo ga hanaseru kedo. Ma, mai nichi garai skawanai. I can still use Japanese. I, I'm actually going to be traveling there um, in April, and I'm planning to do some some recording, some hopefully do some interviewing people and, and going around and doing some checking out vegan restaurants and stuff like that, that there. Uh, I would say... It's kind of unfortunate where when I left Japan to join the military, uh, I was at the, I was kind of, I kind of would, I would generalize, generally say that I was at a kind of like a not really well read junior high school student. Like I could, I could read and write. I could, you know, watch TV in Japanese, read manga but if if somebody tried to hit me with some uh, some science knowledge in Japanese, I would I wouldn't have known the words. But I, as far as everyday functionality, I mean, I was right there. I'm still I can still function, but it's it, maybe I'm knocked down to like a, a seven year old. Mm -hmm. well, that's that's still pretty darn impressive. I mean, I know that especially languages like Japanese, it's kind of one of those things where you sink or swim right you, you you get thrown into that culture and i've got a buddy that went over there and he stayed there for 10 years and was just absolutely fluent you know bl bless him for that um so obviously how long were you there before you left so a total of eight years and wow. from having the the background and studying in university to being there and i i studied up because i wanted to pass the uh nihongo uh, Norioku Shiken. I wanted to, I wanted to get number one. I got number two, which is kind of like junior high school, high school level, uh, level one at that point was a college grad. So it, I got pretty good. I, I was good enough that when I went in the military, I took the JLPT or the Japan Japanese language proficiency test for the, for the army. And I was I was being paid to be able to speak Japanese. Uh, unfortunately, and nothing never came up that they sent me to, uh, I don't know, to take over Tokyo or something cool like that. But uh, um, <clears throat> when you went vegan in 1992, you say in the book, in, y in your book, Vegan Strong, right? Yep. You say that really back then, the only people that were vegan were the punk rockers, hippies, and the avant-garde. Uh, avant I'd like to know, so when it was in your freshman year that you decided that you were going to be a punk rock rocker, what was it about th that, that punk rock mentality that appealed to you? Well, thank you very much for that question. And I would say, well, I got into punk and metal at 13, 14. And it's interesting just because we're having this conversation now and Moby just released his movie, uh, vegan punk rock movie or punk rock vegan movie. Either way, he released uh, a movie of that title, and it really, really encapsulated my experience because I got into animal rights through this, through the through veganism to some extent. I didn't go vegan as a result of it. I went vegan independently, but it definitely supported what I was doing. It was a, a, a be it a small group of people, but it kind of uh, resonated with me. Uh, but yeah, I've been into punk and, and metal and hardcore since I was in high school and junior high. It just the just the music, the the raw power of it. Maybe at first I got into it through through metal and Iron Maiden, so there wasn't any real higher level thinking other than well, the the cover looks cool or, or whatever. What I don't know what version I would have said of that at fourteen. I, I'm sure I wouldn't have said that looks dope because. Kids didn't talk like that. I would, 
Did kids say bitchin'? I don't know what I would have said at 14, but it would probably would have been ridiculous. And it might have involved uh, a four letter word, but uh, but it might not have. I, you know, I don't even know. But I got into it through that, through a cool record cover. And ever since then, it's just been through the, you know, Iron Maiden to Metallica to the Misfits, the Misfits to Minor Threat and Minor Threat to starting to think uh, Minor Threat was our first straight edge band or first straight edge band I at least had heard because I, I think there's some other ones you could say were might have been pre Minor Threat, but Minor Threat really brought straight edge to the, the forefront and straight edge for those probably that don't know, though it was it's brought up in Moby's movie is uh, a lifestyle of sobriety and trying to rise above all the chemical addictive substances that are out there that society offers like alcohol, drugs, and smoking and trying to think outside the box. And I think I was able to embrace first vegetarianism and then veganism because I had already said, you know what, I'm, let me let me try this straight edge thing. And when I did, it kind of opened me up to, oh, maybe not everything that society is trying to feed me, like literally trying to feed me. They're trying to feed me dead animals on my plate. They're trying to feed me a bucket full of lies. And, you know, maybe I can see through some of that. Well, what I really like too is in the book where you describe how you also stopped drinking. I think it was your freshman year, and there was something about that minor threat, uh, straight edge song that kind of that mental freedom through substance free living that uh, that appealed to you. I know it appeals to me greatly, and especially has for the last you know twenty something years. Oh, right uh, on, right on. It it was very much the culmination of events, life events that were going on for me right at that time. So my, I drank on and off through high school, like most kids that I knew, and, yeah. and that was normal. But I had heard of this band, I had heard the lyrics, but it didn't necessarily crystallize in my brain until that the summer after I graduated from high school, my dad got me a, a job working on a ship. And so, as you would guess, most tropes of the drunken sailor and stuff like that existed. So there were some young guys who were like me who were like, you know, just wanted the wanted a summer job. But most of the people had had jobs through the Navy, through working on on ships their whole life and were either functioning or non-functioning alcoholics. And being able to interact with them on a daily basis and go drinking with them and see kind of like where the where that excess and where that lifestyle was headed, uh, I just thought, you know what, this isn't really for me. But it, it hadn't really, I hadn't stuck the landing, so to speak. Hmm. On going straight edge, I just thought, you know, maybe uh, I could see maybe a couple beers and you're, you know, out with your friends and having a good time. But at the point where you have to make those couple beers into a case and now you got to, you know, just get, get all crazy and hurt somebody over to hurt yourself or break some stuff or get in a, an accident or DUI. That just didn't make sense. And then my, my freshman year of college, I still remember the, within the first week, I went in the buddy's room and he threw me a beer and I cracked it. I took a sip and I just looked at it out. And I thought of all those guys that I hung out with and, and their experiences and I remember all the stories of the broken families and the, the divorces and all the regrets. And I just looked down at the beer and I put it down. I said, okay, that's it. That's my last beer. I'm straight edge. And that was 1991 September. Usually wow. not what you do your first week of college, but uh, that's, yeah. What are you drinking there? Is that a little uh, seltzer water? A little LaCroix. So when I do interviews, I'm, for anybody who's seen me in other interviews, usually drink, do a coffee, black, mm -hmm. and a LaCroix. Uh-huh. I find hydration to be one of the best things that you can do for your body. And when you're talking a lot, it keeps your mouth moist and you don't want to, you know, have the, you know, dry mm -hmm. mouth where it's hard to, hard to actually speak or say a word. Yep. Yep. Cheers to you on drinking some water. So let's get back. Let's get back to Japan Ooh. because, because nine 11 hit right, right in the middle of you having just a, fantastic time, no responsibilities. And you equate it to kind of the feeling that you had, I think, running throughout your body and your bones 
to, you know, the greatest uh, generation answering the call after Pearl Harbor, where you're like, okay, uh, I, I got to do something here. So what did, what did you do? So I got, I heard about the 9-11 attacks. Very first time I got a text on my phone. I'm walking home from work at around 10 at night. Remember, this is Japan time versus, or Tokyo time versus New York time. So with the difference, it was a 12 hour difference. And I was seeing the attacks at night at the end of my day. So I got a, a text that said two big buildings and a fire in New York and a plane. And I'm like, I know my kanji's not great and I'm tired, but this is like, what is this is like word salad? Like, wh like word, what does this mean? And then a friend of mine called me and was like hysteric. You got to look, get it, you know, get to a TV. You got to see what, what's going on. Well, uh, my DIY punk rockness, even back then, was I don't have a regular TV and I couldn't sit down and watch. I would only watch movies or play video games. Uh, and I'd get news through the internet and stuff like that. So I had to knock on a neighbor's door. Like, just I randomly went through all the the uh, the apartment building next to me. Uh, and I'm like, hey, can I, can I watch TV? I heard something's going on. And finally, somebody let me go in and, and we sat there and we watched in real time this second plane hit and and it just seemed like the end of days. And I'm sure most of the people that were kids back then are not even born. It's really hard to put in the words and imagine what it was like, but it really felt apocalyptic, maybe not like the apocalypse, but a little bit of time, a little bit of uh, context leading up to 2000 in the Y2K kind of thing. There was a lot of paranoia, a lot of fear that something crazy was going to happen in the year 2000. And a lot of it came down to internet hype and, and hocus pocus that somehow when all the computers that were set to the nineties turned to the two thousands, computers were going to crash and we were going to go into bedlam. Obviously that was all ridiculous. But that's what a lot of people thought was going to happen. Nothing happened. So when we were attacked, when 9-11 happened, I think a lot of that feeling kind of came up as uh, obviously that was an awful event, but that it was more, maybe there was more to it. Maybe, maybe things are really crashing down. And I think people were just really, really scared. Uh, when I saw that in, in real time, from an ocean like separated from thousands of miles and living in japan i just thought well all right this the, the party's over i have to actually do something with meaningful with my life i have to go help and i think a lot of that probably comes from my punk rock background that diy that uh, that do it yourself you can't just let the government or let other people do stuff there, there's something that you yourself can do so even though there was just there was this idea I needed to do something, it didn't at first crystallize into I need to join the military. So what I first did was I put on a bunch of benefit shows mm -hmm. uh, with my band Till I Die for survivors, first survivors, and was this was this over in Japan or in, in the Japan States? in Japan? Oh, so, so so your band was made up of yourself and what other Americans or Japanese? Oh no no, uh, thank you very much for asking. No, it was me and at that point three other other people who were Japanese, nice, and, and who were also uh, vegans who were also into the straight edge movement and and into into you know hardcore heavy metal or whatever kind of verbiage you want to use. And I didn't at first tell them that I was going to be joining the military. I just said, hey, we need to do these benefits. Uh, and the first benefits we did were for the, the children of the uh, or uh, the children of people who had perished in the attacks and just money for organiz organizations for them. And then as, as we started to invade Afghanistan and set up the bomb, then that switched to kids that were survivors and whose parents had died over there. Cause I, I thought, you know, it kind of, if you're a kid raised in Afghanistan and your parents are dead, I mean, that's awful and too. So we did benefits and we just sent money over there as well. Uh, whether we were able to help a lot of people, I don't know. And sometimes I, when I ended up going over there and serving, I wondered if any of the same people mm. who were attacking us were possibly uh, had been recipients of that money and how kind of, ironic it would be yeah yeah um 
All right. So you decided at some point that you're going to join the army, go to, go to boot camp, Right. And so what year was that? And, and where was it? And what was that experience like? So I fall of 2002, I had made that decision and I went into basic training 2003, January 14. It's, it's a funny thing. Most people don't, other than their special uh, dates, like whenever they were married and when they were born, most people don't know those dates, but anyone that served, you know, the, your initial data process, you know, your data separation, like those are dates that you, you know, you, you have to throw around how much that you end up learning. Okay. You know, this is the day that I entered the, the army. This is the day that I separated. Um, probably, no, I, I don't know if reservists have the same, same thing. Cause they're, you know, there's much, it's much longer and you're not doing it full time anyway, but with the, with the active duty military, you know, those dates. Yeah. It's funny. I, um, <laughs> I know exactly the day that I started <clears throat> my career as a firefighter, mm -hmm. September 3rd, 1997. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny how that sticks with you. Um, all right. So what kind of harassment and belittling did you get? And it sounds like on a daily basis uh, in the uh, in boot camp and then subsequently in the army. Boot camp, not that much people knew that people who would sit with me uh while we were eating figured out real quick that i wasn't i wasn't doing everything on everybody else's exactly the same way because they could see like hey this is what everyone else is eating and this is what muir is eating and i have vegan tattooed on the back of my neck so it only took one you know changing into pt gear to be like what the f yeah what the you know, what is it? What's going on with that? I, uh, I didn't try to hide it, but I didn't try to bring it into everyone's faces when I didn't need to. As far as actually harassment, uh, I think because vegan is often tied to hippie. And if you're trying to do super ultra kind of like, like masculine things, then that could be brought up if you're not performing. I was I was in really good shape. It was never an issue in basic training, at least, other than the fact that I was kind of starving to death. And sometimes I would get spacey because if you know if you get if you're doing if you're working out 14 hours a day on a thousand calories, oh yeah, it's gonna take its toll and it's not gonna take too long for you to not be doing too well. But uh, I would not recommend uh doing that outside of the military trying to go on some kind of crazy di crash diet like that it, it's awful did i lose weight yeah uh i mean i guess i looked like i was in good shape but i felt felt awful being on such a, a caloric restriction it's not that there's anything wrong with the vegan diet i mean obviously you've been vegan for a, a hot minute too and you know you feel great but it's the doing vegan right and doing vegan in most of our training scenarios is hard. I mean, can you make it through it? Sure. I know you can make it through because I made it through it. And I made it through basic training into AIT, which my our four month medic training in, in uh, um, uh, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, yeah, Fort Sam Houston to back to Benning and um, airborne school. And then I spent four months in or a ranger training battalion to be a ranger. What ended up getting me DQ'd or disqualified was they saw that uh, the vegan tattoo on the back of my neck and they had a thing out for me on that. Would I have made uh, a good ranger? You know, I don't know. I was in really good shape and I was a good medic. I didn't have that, that same like killer mentality that the very first day of training when I went to the 75th RTB, the, the guy in charge goes, men, rangers are not soldiers. Rangers are, sorry for the word, fucking killers. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm, I'm probably not, I'm a lot of things. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a killer. I'm a, I'm a medic. I joined the military because I wanted to make the world a better place. I joined, you know, I became a paratrooper because I had watched probably two, like, 
too many uh, episodes of Band of Brothers, and I was like fully stoked on that whole uh, mystique of the paratroopers. And also to, due to the allure of movies, I had watched Black Hawk Down, and that's what made me try to become a ranger. I got through most of uh, the ranger in doc program, and then they kicked me out pretty much the the last week because they found a, a convenient loophole. They they said that uh, they said that I had used my cell phone during the duty duty day, and that it was like a violation of of code being on a cell phone, which was BS. But in most of those the scenarios, and you probably have seen you know elite kind of teams, you can pretty much choose whoever you want. And to be fair to them, you know, at that time, I was probably a little bit, I wouldn't ever describe myself as hippie woo woo, but there was probably a little more of me in the very beginning of that, of still like, let's not hurt people for no reason kind of thing versus yeah. like by, after a whole tour tour of duty in Afghanistan, I probably had a little less of, of that in me. Hmm. Uh, well, I'd love, I mean, to the extent that you're comfortable you know, you talk about in your book how you did a, a year, uh, a year long tour in Afghanistan and that it was kind of surrealistic. Oh, yeah. Looking back on it. I mean, for those of us that have never served, never been to, you know, Afghanistan, especially under those conditions, what what can you tell us about it? You know, I think it's probably going to be it's a lot of it. The 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 bad stuff is going to be very similar to the stuff you saw as a firefighter. Like trauma is trauma, and when you're in situations like that, like fight or flight, life or death situations, that's going to leave a mark on you. Like I I explain PTSD in in this way. Everything you do, no matter what it is, is going to have some impact on your life. However, situations like a near near miss or a life or death situation or some kind of awfulness is going to be more impactful to you than when you had an ice cream cone. You're probably not going to remember that, like, you know, sitting and eating some vegan Ben and Jerry's as much as you are where a car almost hit you, or maybe it did hit you. And in this, this situation with uh, being deployed, people are not, not always trying to hurt you, but often trying to hurt you. Uh, and if they're not, and it, this could really extends to any theater of operations from Afghanistan to Iraq to I'm sure, unfortunately, our future wars. It's the it's not just going to be the actual situations, but the the background anxiety that something could happen. And then you, when you see it happen, some things happen to other people like I would see. Well, not just see well, when guys would get hit by an IED and we. They bring the guys back and we'd work on um, the Marines or, or other soldiers who had been hit in an IED attack. You're not in danger yourself, but you're kind of living it through working on these guys that just got hit and blown up and you're trying to save their lives and then send them on a medevac. Mm. And the culmination of daily direct attacks and mortar attacks and, you know, and being shot at to driving through IED alley yourself and, you know, that kind of stuff takes its toll. Um, I would, I would definitely put my experience in Afghanistan as I am extremely lucky. I wrote the government a blank check for my life. Like everybody that serves that anyone that serves, that's uh, that raises the right hand and swears an allegiance to our, our country. You know, you're writing the government a blank check up and including to your, your, so I feel extremely blessed, uh, as a paratrooper, I, I kind of jacked up my back and my hips and in Afghanistan, I like the daily attacks kind of jarred my brain a little bit, but I, you know, I can still walk, talk. And, uh, I, I feel very, very blessed to have made it through that. You know, not everybody can say that obviously. Well, if you're yeah. deceased, you can't say anything. Uh, so I feel very, very lucky. And, you know, I didn't hate being in the military. I think that's kind of a misconception that I think a lot of uh, my fellow vegans might just not, not, that's just something I think a lot, talking to a lot of our, our vegan friends, they just are not going to get, they ex expect that it was going to be all 100% bad and that I was just, you know, suffering the whole time. I mean, 
mo most often, uh, if we weren't deployed, I would just be hanging out with my buddies, uh, at, you know, working out or shooting guns and stuff like that. And it's really, it's hard for me not to like some of that, uh, you know, the camaraderie, you know, going to work out, you know, running the obstacle course like that, yeah. as we see with these mud runs and Spartan races, that stuff, civilians like pay good money for it to do, uh, and nobody's paying them. And that was my job to do that. You know, I loved all that. It was really for me, the, the stuff that, that kind of, that sucked were, I mean, first and foremost, if I had to go in a training scenario and have to rely on someone else to bring my food and I can't, you know, I'm relying on unreliable people because they're, you know, they don't cater to anyone to be fair to them. But I, if you're somebody that's uh, a vegan or is eating gluten free or has a religious background that excludes you from eating quote unquote mainstream food, you're going to suffer from that. Uh, so that part kind of sucked. And if I had made it through ranger training by made it through, I mean, they not kicked me out randomly for having vegan tattooed on my neck. Yeah. Then I would have been spent sent to special operations, medical training, which in would have included what we called back then the goat lab, which have you heard of that? I never. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you haven't, but at the same point, it is something we need to end. They had a practice where you would, pr you would practice your emergency medical skills on live tissue, i.e. they would bring an animal in and they would shoot it, stab it, chop off a limb, and then you're supposed to save it. And they do that multiple times until the animal dies. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not have participated in that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, like I would, I would have been a flat, flat, no, like no freak under any circumstances. So, you know, maybe they were doing me a favor. Maybe they saw the writing on the wall and they were like, you know, this, this dude, there's no way, Yeah. you know, that it's going to make any sense. And one of the great things about being in 75th RTB is in order to kind of like punish me for not having what it, takes to be a ranger or not have not being the full skill set to be like a, a killer as 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 they said they sent me to the seven, 173rd uh, airborne brigade which was amazing it was an amazing group of guys and gals an amazing experience and i thrived in that that in that uh unit and i loved being a part of the airborne community however you and know that, the, that was in italy right that was in italy in vicenza italy it, one of the funny things that uh i don't think civilians uh see and, and you're not really missing much is there's a lot of different inner inner unit uh rivalry in the in the army and and in all all branches but there's a like kind of a kind of like brothers and sisters will make fun of each other so it's the army and the navy or, or the army and the marines are back and forth of who's better and who's what whose uniforms are dumb and whatever and there's also like what within the the service uh, there's a, there's like an, I guess a pecking order, there's a batting order. And then there's a like ribbing and making fun of each other. And it's part of the socialization of being in, in that situation. But as, a as a, a ranger candidate, we were basically told like, you know, the only thing worse than death would be to be a non airborne personnel. Like anybody that's not a paratrooper is the absolute scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, like not even not even worthy of breath. It's it was kind of ridiculous. It's a ridiculous thing, but that's part of the brainwashing process. And uh, uh, I never really bought into any of it, but it is something that you're 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 taught. And yeah. so to be you know sent kind of as a punishment outside of the I guess the the, the ranger community to become a paratrooper. It, I feel like I got, I, I really won the lottery because it was like the best scenario for me. Um, and Afghanistan sometimes had rough moments and usually related to food, but uh, you know, being, being still part of a, a fairly elite unit and getting stationed in Italy, which have you been to Italy yet? I have been to Italy. Yeah. I, I, did you go as a vegan? The food is amazing. I, I did. I went back in 19, uh, 1980, 89, actually. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was doing a triathlon over there. I even, 
even back in like the 2000s, it was amazing for vegan food. And I just, if I had, if I had a hundred lights, uh, a hundred uh, lives that I could live, I would definitely live a couple in Italy and in, and in Europe in general. It's just yeah. so freaking awesome. Yeah. You, you even got a, a doctor's note that said that you basically should be eating vegan, right? When you I were did, I did. And I have the, a picture in, in the, in the book and, I, and on my Instagram, if you don't feel like uh, yeah. buying the book for it, if you have, you're just going to have to do some scrolling. I call it the, uh, the golden ticket. Willy Wonka got a golden ticket to go to not Willy Wonka, but uh, what's that dude's name? Whoever, whatever the kid is in, in Willy Wonka. Yeah, Charlie. It was Charlie. Name. Thank you. Charlie in the chocolate, chocolate factory. Yeah. Guy. There's your doctor's note right there. So basically we had a battalion surgeon and I just came up to him and I was like, you know, doc, uh, I don't feel like I, whenever I have to go to the chow hall, I'm able to get enough food as a vegan eating plant-based here uh, kind of sucks. Uh, could you write me a doctor's note that says that I need to get vegan food? And he was like, yeah. he's like, yeah, I guess. And I was like, please. So I took that note and I leveraged that to get a, to be allowed to live in an apartment outside of the barracks to be off post to not have to go to the chow hall. And that was night and day different being able to get yeah. enough food and being able to, to cook for myself. It was just amazing. Uh, I think there's the lesson to be learned in there is almost many situations in life, almost always in life, you're going to be given the normal path, which would have been in my case, suck it up and drive on and deal with it. And just, mm -hmm. but because I was able to think outside the box and say, okay, and what's going to, what can I do to improve my situation? You know, now, granted, we do have a, a saying also in the military, suffer in silence. You know, you keep that shit to yourself. But, you know, basic training was awful for me, not because of any of the training, but just because I wasn't doing it enough calories. Mm -hmm. And by thinking outside the box and by getting that, that letter written and being able to go and, and basically turn my military life until I deployed as kind of a nine to five job where I'm, you know, I have that autonomy. I'm able to cook for myself. I mean, I had usually had a 290 to 299 out of 300 PT test. Uh, I was just not fast enough. I think I was doing a 13 and some change two mile while I was in. I would max out push ups and sit ups, uh, but I was always a little bit slow. You also Slower maxed out the plank. You also ma maxed out that five minute plank. That was good. Yeah, I would. I'd be able to do that too, and and pull ups as well, because I know when I was with the with our seventy fifth RTB, we had to do their PT test was fun. They would do a run to do the PT test, and then you do pull ups. You do pull ups, push ups, sit ups, and then you do. They would always find a way to make it more than it actually was, because to be honest. When you're in the military, and I'm sure it's the same as a firefighter, you don't want anybody who just does the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. Like, no, like that, that, that makes no sense. And the military is not a place for people that just do the bare minimum. Yeah. And I took that same out of the box thinking to kind of segue to Afghanistan and how I was in a war zone as a vegan. I took that same out of the box thinking to applied it to when I was going to be deployed. I knew that being deployed, I was going to be back in a situation where I wasn't going to have daily access to a wholesome, nutritious food. I knew that that was, that's basically an afterthought of feeding, feeding the guys and gals who are deployed. And I thought, how can I set myself up for success? How can I put myself in the best situation to be able to provide the best care for the men and women that I was serving with. Cause as, as a medic, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm always going to be ready to go without excuses. And, and for that, I need to get proper nutrition. So what I did, well, I did two things. The first thing I did was I got these gigantic boxes and I filled it with everything that I might need. And I had soy milk in there. I had, I had vegan ramen. I had cliff bars, which were around back then, which, for those that were around back then, you know, you remember Cliff Bars were such a game changer. It, it felt like you were eating a, a candy bar at every bite. Uh, nowadays, obviously, you know, only a candy bar is a candy bar. But back then, if you hadn't had a candy bar in 10 years, like 
The Cliff Bar was amazing. Oh. And, and I got all that stuff and I put it in these 75 pound box. I shipped them to myself because we had an address that uh, for Bagram, I think it was, or I, I'm pretty sure I sent them to Bagram, Bagram Airfield in uh, Afghanistan. And I was so proud of myself and that I had been able to like think outside the box. So we get to, we get in country and first briefing, they're telling us about rules of engagement and going through like, you know, bullets. And they gave me a, a sandwich baggie of like 30 bullets for my nine mil, which was kind of funny. Like it just was not what I expected like war to be like. And then they were like, oh yeah, doc, by the way, you, one of your boxes exploded. And Oh. I was like a deer in headlights. I remember going with this gesture, which you're not going to get from the book. But if you, for those who can see this, I go with my hands exploded. And for the next, I don't, I would say like six months, anytime where we were attacked or there was an ID attack, someone would go in my goofy ass voice. Uh, like, did it explode? Was there a, you know, mortar, mortar explode? Yeah. Uh, which, if it wasn't me and if I wasn't in that situation, I'm sure I would have found hilarious because I said it in a funny way, yeah. uh, unintentionally. But, you know, when I think I was just staring out in the space and I was like exploded, I just couldn't I couldn't believe that like it was like everything in, in that place. It just was surreal. And I was like, well, what am I going to do now? I have like now I've cut my rations in half. So I found out through somebody uh, through somebody else that there was a website called anysoldier.com ah. <laughs> and I had been, well, there was, there was actually a progression to this. First I was eating that food that I, the, the 75 pounds, well, the 75 pounds that I had left, I ate that down to nothing. Then I was relying on the chow hall, but they pretty much just had stale uh, for vegan stuff. It was like, it was like basically a 10 by 10 plywood box. And there were a couple of Marines that were press ganged into being cooks. They didn't know how to cook. They would just open these tins and, and none, none of that was vegan, obviously. And I, and even asking them, I mean, poor guys, I, I don't need, it, it would, it wouldn't have, uh, none of that would have worked. Yeah. So they did have stale bagels. So thinking, how am I going to cobble together meals for the next, uh, like, like 350 days on stale bagels. I don't know. Uh, and so I'm just thinking, trying to think, okay, what can I do? So the number 12 MRE, at least the bean burrito at the time was vegan, which I, for those that follow me on social media, I am trying to work with mercy for animals to get an all vegan MRE again, but mm. that's, uh, that's, that's in the works. At least 16 years ago, they had one MRE that had that was mostly vegan. Now they don't even have that. But anyway, and then I lost was, access to that. They, they realized that, that- Bill, for those who don't know what an MRE is, what, what okay. does it stand for? Meals ready to eat. So anysoldier.com, people sent you all kinds of stuff. You also, at one point, you got absolutely sick and tired of chili. To this day, you're sick and tired of canned chili, correct? Thank you very much for, for that question. So yeah, so- AnySoldier.com was amazing. I, I I had first put that uh, basically the way I got food from from that from people all over the world is that I wrote, hey, there's I'm I have a platoon of soldiers and there people need this and that and the other probably Maxim magazine dip and uh, chewing tobacco and and oh by the way there's a vegan and people it just lost their minds. They were like, you know. A lot of people at back in 2000, this was 2005, hadn't even heard the word vegan. And then they look it up. They're like, there's somebody that's maintaining that way of life in a war zone, like yeah. on purpose. Like, that's ridiculous. And to be fair to them, you know, maybe it is. Maybe it was. I don't know. I was going to do it anyway. That Like, I, I specifically joined the military for the reason that I became vegan, that I wanted to see a better world. And I thought... I joined the military because I thought, hey, as a 29-year-old who's seen the world I, I, and who cares about people and animals, I could do a better job than your average 18-year-old who's going to be joining for, for that, for just for college. Yeah. But I digress. So I said, hey, this vegan needs, needs stuff. And I would get boxes and boxes and boxes. Anytime that they would do a, a mail drop with us, I would get between five and 20 boxes and, and pretty big sizable boxes granted it none no perishable stuff so i it wasn't like i was getting fresh produce 
be able to make uh, wonderful salads, but I got enough stuff that I could live. And then I would, of course, spread the rest out to my, my guys and then give some to locals. Well, toward the end, I had to cut it off because I was still getting enough stuff that I had to have my own mini Connex, which for those that don't know what Connex, Connex is like a, a storage container. And that was kind of, that was obviously a scenario that was not intended that I was going to have my own dedicated Connex. So I was like, okay, uh, please no more stuff. I really appreciate everybody. And so I ate everything down to my final month in March of 2006. I remember because I got out and uh, we left Afghanistan in, in 2006. Uh, Is that when you I left had, the army? Sorry, say again. Is that when you left the army? I left the army. I separated. You don't leave directly from theater. So I, we, I, we left country in, in March of 2006. And my separation was uh, June of 2006. After they have a whole bunch of like mm -hmm. out processing stuff. But so I was left with just cans of chili. And I had chili stacked from the floor to the ceiling of the hooch that I was in of this basically okay. plywood box we were living in. And every day I would take another can off the, off the, uh, the pile and just crack it and eat. I, I just, I stopped bothering to try to heat it up because it really didn't improve the taste for me. And to this day, when someone offers me chili or my, my mom and my mom is a little bit forgetful and she'll say like, Hey, we, if I'm visiting home, we'll make some chili and I'll just, I'll just kind of go Bleh. like, no, like no thanks to chili. I'm sure, I'm sure for, for those that love chili, it has nothing to do with the taste of chili. Can you, it's just can you remember what brand, of, can you remember what brand of chili it was? And was it like a three you know? Thing? I'm pretty sure there were some Amy's in there. I'm uh, okay. I don't I, I can't be positive. I know that they had people had gone through great pains to send me vegan stuff, but okay. it wasn't always great. Um, so well, and just so you know, Amy's just so you know, Sergeant Vegan, we have six new chilies coming out. <laughs> <laughs> in the plant strong uh food line so i'll have to send you some and see oh you no, no 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 thank you no thank you no thank you oh I'm dude we got, it. No, we got it we got it we got it we got an ethiopian spice lentil that's got this burberry huh how does that sound for you no it sounds <laughs> awful no no thank you too i it's just one of those things i if if i have another uh, so if so, I have another 50, 60 years in me and I don't even eat another bowl of chili, it'll be yeah. still too soon. So what are some of your favorite recipes? What do you what do you love to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Give me a, a like a typical day. Well, so I'm doing something, I've been doing something different in the last uh, two months. I'm usually not eating lunch. And my and my my schedule my eating schedule, whether I'm going to work or whether I'm at home, is also different. So today is day two of not being at, at work. So I usually work Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I have Wednesday that is just basically a sit on the couch and play video games day. Mm -hmm. um, and this is because I work a compressed schedule. For those that are thinking of working a compressed schedule in healthcare, like me, just know that it's going to be great on paper that you only work three days a week. But it doesn't mean you're going to necessarily have four days of free because at least one day you're going to have energy for nothing. And yeah. so my first day after working, you know, three compressed night schedules is I'll sit on the couch and do nothing. And then yeah. today I'm this is my first full day of being awake and seeing that seeing the sunshine. I'm going to probably go to the gym and either do legs or chest later. Uh, well, so and, for, and, and Bill, for yes, people yes. for people that don't know, you are a registered nurse at West Los Angeles um, VA Medical Center, and you have referred to this not as a career but as a calling. How long have you been uh, working there as a registered nurse? Well, thank you very much for asking. I've been with the VA. I've been an RN at the VA for eight years. I started. Started back into healthcare. Well, at first I got out of the military. I was going to open a vegan restaurant. I went to vegan culinary school. Uh, this one, fortunately, was 2008. And for those that don't remember, 2008, the economy collapsed. Not a great time to open a business. Or maybe a great time. I don't know. But uh, for some people who are really out-of-the-box thinkers, but I wasn't that far. After the economy collapsed, I was like, okay, what can I do? I ended up going to Haiti on a, a humanitarian mission as their medic. 
in 2010. And that got me back into wanting to do healthcare again. And kind of also probably surprising for a lot of people, I rejoined the military in the reserves and I was a reserve medic for two years. And during that time, I became a nursing assistant and then I transitioned into wanting to become an RN. I I quit my job as a nursing assistant. I went back to school and I mean, Uncle Sam was good on his word and I went, I got a degree in a bachelor's of science and nursing for free. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. the most unfree thing you can do is get free quote unquote money from the uh, government, but uh, I got free, free education and I, you know, it was a really good school. Drexel University is awesome in Philadelphia for the, those who don't know, great school. And I've been an RN ever since. It's definitely, thank you very much for saying a calling. You dedicated Vegan Strong uh, My mom. To, to your mom, who who I guess has been super supportive. Um, have you always been close to your mom? My mom and my family, yeah. Um, I, my parents, like, I would, I would hope this is an experience that you and everyone else here has as well. I mean, my parents were amazing. My parents are still amazing people. Uh, very grateful that they're, they're still with us to, to this day. Yeah, I, I, I have a close family uh, and and they're, they're, they're super supportive of everything I do. I mean, they've had to, unfortunately, like uh, bear with me as I live abroad for mm-hmm. years upon years. And then, you know, say that, okay, I'm finally coming back to the States, but that coming back to the States via Italy. I mean, that's just kind of a crazy choice to make. <laughs> and then I moved to California. So that's uh, my family's mostly in Philadelphia still, you know, so they put up with me and they've, uh, they bear, uh, put up with a lot of, a lot of guff from me. Um, <laughs> One of the funny early Sergeant Vegan moments, and my parents aren't vegetarian, but they're very supportive. But I, uh, when I first wrote, went vegan, uh, I wrote "Meat is Death" on one of my mom's cookbooks, uh, uh, and really, really big letters. Like I think it was like the '70s style, like because at least there was a picture of what looks very old timey and this like pot roast or some crap like that, and I just defaced her book in a very disrespectful, I mean, it, I would argue accurate, but disrespectful manner. Uh, and they put up with years of very self-righteous uh, Sergeant Vegan yeah. uh, mouthings. I mean, even before I was Sergeant Vegan, I was would say stuff. You know, all of all the stuff and all of the ways I've thought about, about that, I don't think any of that was necessarily wrong, but there's definitely a right and a wrong way to interact with people. And if it's, and if they, you know, the, I would say the for easily the first 20 years of being vegan, I was probably interacting with people in a mostly negative way. Like nobody needs a meat is murder sign jammed in your face. You know, they, what they, people need is they need to see someone that's living a happy, helpful, awesome life, living vegan strong, like, like we are being very stoked about, about life. And that kind of, that kind of feeling will, in my opinion, will do more than just angry finger pointing. Yeah. That'll definitely rub off. So you definitely, so you dedicated this book, not only to your mom, but also to animal rights, human rights, the vegan movement, um, the armed services, the men and women in the armed services. And then lastly, that, you know what, freedom isn't free. It certainly isn't. And for, I would love to see us not need military. I would love to see us not need cops. I would love to see, I mean, I'm sure you're the same, even as a firefighter, you would love to see us not need fighter fighters, right? I would love to see us not need nurses. I would, I would love to have this, this like paradise, uh, be available. And then every man, woman, and live in peace and harmony. But unfortunately, I don't think that exists. I think you're always going to need to stand up and be there to help others. And unfortunately, the reality of the world, I think there is still going to be hostile nations uh, that that are going to want to hurt other people for no reason. And you're going to need people in the military. And unfortunately, 
unfortunately, as much as I would love there not to be police, we're still going to need people in that role. We're going to need, you know, we're going to definitely need more compassionate people and definitely more people that are going to have more restraint. But uh, to think that there's no going to be no more robberies uh, is ludicrous to me. So, yeah, yeah. I, I dedicate and I would we dedicate our lives to making the world a better place and appreciate people who are willing to put their life on the line for others and are willing to go outside themselves and do something for the benefit of the world. And knowing that, you know, whatever pay you're going to get for it is usually not going to be, uh, is not actually going to compensate you for the sacrifice that you're going to make for that job, but just realizing that it's for the, a better world, right? Yeah. So Sergeant Vegan, what did you have? Cause you, 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 you evaded me. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Thank you very much for that question. So I know I mentioned uh, tofu scramble in, in my book and I have a, a daily recipe. I actually rock some tofu scramble. Now, the way I make my tofu scramble is a little bit different from others. So I will, will elaborate. Uh, I, first, I start with extra firm tofu. You can use other different levels of firmness. However, for those that don't know, if you, you use a soft or a, a medium firm tofu, you're going to get a lot of liquid. And that's just, in my opinion, going to just make up for a messy, sloppy mess. No, no, no good. No good. Got to do the extra firm always. And you can play with the firmness too. You could freeze just so you yeah. don't know. It, you could freeze soft tofu and then mm -hmm. squeeze the water out of it. It goes for medium. And you can also change the consistency if you want to freeze, you know, really any block of tofu. And then when you thaw it, it, it changes the... I think it changes the chemical uh, makeup of of the actual thing in that it's it's more dense. Yeah. Anyway, from there, yep, yep. From there, I cube, season, and then I add vegetables. I'll, I do a. I, I've been kind of a somewhere between lazy and smart in that I usually use frozen vegetables because I can get it and store it and always have it ready, and I don't have to go to the supermarket. I do a, a mix of onions, peppers, and well, that's just it. And then I also do broccoli in, in that as well. And uh, there was a sale on field roast, so I added two field roasts. So one, just one field roast sausage is 20 grams of protein. So combination of those two in the tofu. I didn't eat the whole thing, but half of it, I would reckon that was probably about 75 grams of protein, maybe thereabouts. So Bill... Um I want to end this with a, a quote that you have in your book, and it, it goes like this. My belief is that being vegan not only promotes physical health and strength, but also makes us mentally and spiritually badass. I stand by that. I wrote that, that, I wrote that in 2016, 17, the book, put out the book in 2018. I, I still totally stand by that statement. There is this idea that vegans and the media will often try to try to portray us as uh, the butt of a joke, as that we're somehow weak. I mean, look, look at you. You're ripped. I mean, I'm I'm no slouch myself. I think that to portray vegans as anything but people, whether men or women, who want to make the world a better place and not contribute to the unnecessary suffering of animals and also the unnecessary destruction of the planet, and also not contribute to the unnecessary suffering of their fellow men and women. Because let's face it, those carcinogens yeah. in that decaying, rotting flesh, and that those animal products that we don't need to eat, it's ridiculous. And going vegan and realizing, thinking outside the box, that we can be perfectly happy and healthy without all that unnecessary garbage is awesome it is badass and standing up for fellow fellow humans and fellow animals and being able to have that inner strength especially when others are telling you that you're wrong nothing more badass than that mm -mm. i i agree thank you for for letting us kind of um more deeply understand your story your journey showing us how you can be vegan even in incredible situations like being in the army, being in a war zone, 
You just got to, if you want it bad enough, it's yours for the taking. And uh, you've been doing this now, what, 30 years, did you say? Yeah, this uh, past August made 30. So now I'm at 30 and some change. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I would love to love to make it to, to 90 years. We'll see what happens. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So to a fellow strong, you're vegan strong, I'm plan strong. Give me a fist bump as we head out. Bang! Boom. Sergeant Vegan's books, including his memoir, Vegan Strong, are available now at Amazon. And I'll be sure to put a link to that in the show notes. Thanks again to Sergeant Vegan for heeding his calling to serve others. And thanks to all of you who are heeding the call to keep it plan strong. See y'all next week. Thank you for listening to the Plan Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.